Our firefighters and first responders are at the tip of that spear in caring for our airmen and our families in amazing ways. Nothing is accomplished without a team mindset. When you go out to establish and enhance a great culture, it begins with genuine leadership. This is the Fire Dog Podcast. Welcome, my name is Ben Perry, and thank you for joining us on Episode 9 of the Fire Dog Podcast. Today, we're not joined by a firefighter, but rather a command chief. The chief has been in the Air Force for 26 years, been assigned to nine bases, and is currently the command chief of the 3rd Air Force, headquartered at Ramstein Air Base, Germany. He is the senior enlisted leader at the Numbered Air Force, serving nearly 30,000 airmen throughout Europe and Africa. Please welcome my teammate, Chief Master Sergeant Randy Kwiatkowski, known to most simply as Chief K. Welcome, Chief. Hey, Ben, it's great to be here, man, and I appreciate you inviting me to be on your show. I tell you, it's been great uh, watching this dream come to fruition, and I know your community appreciates your passion that you're pouring into this project as well. Yeah, it's been a fun ride so far. We've, uh, like I said, this is episode nine. I know we probably have about a hundred more in the hopper before we run out of ideas, and I'm sure we'll get plenty in the meantime. Yeah, it's been great. You're putting on some awesome shows. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Just to share a little bit with our listeners about how Chief and I know each other, I actually work for the Chief. So I've kind of alluded to in the show before that I'm outside of the career field right now doing somewhat of a special duty. So I work with the Chief handling trip planning and kind of day-to-day office stuff. But man, I tell you, it's been such an uh, honor and a privilege to come up there and learn another perspective and that not only of a higher headquarters, but of the of you yourself, chief, it's, it's just been a, an amazing ride so far. And, uh, although I will miss it when I go back, I am looking forward to getting back with my tribe here in a few months. Well, Hey Ben, I, and you know, I hate to correct you on your own show, but truly I, I, I work for you. You, you tell me where to go. You tell me what to wear. You tell me what to talk about. Um, so no, it's been awesome having you on the team. I'm blessed that you, uh, took a chance on, on coming up and working for me. But truly, I, I'm, I'm the guy that's really working for you. Well, all the same, thanks for coming on the show and sharing your perspective. Firefighters around the globe are plugged into this, so I hope they're able to gain a little bit of the wisdom that you've been able to share with me. Would you mind telling them just a little about your background? What brought you into and kept you in the Air Force? Yeah, absolutely. I So starting this journey off, I grew up in a small farming and ranching community in south central Nebraska, and I believe the population of my hometown of Overton is sitting around 450 people. I spent most of my free time working on a family farm operation. I started working there when I was 12 and continued to work there until, no kidding, the day before I entered the Air Force. Uh, so what brought me here really was uh, I was sitting in class in the seventh grade and my English teacher was presenting uh, her perspectives. And she said, you know, she believes that it's, it should be a requirement for every American to give at least two years of service to their country. And, and her mes- message resonated with me in amazing ways. And, and I couple that influence with the fact that my dad also served in the Air Force. He was a POL airman, worked in aircrew flight equipment as well. And uh, you know, joining the Air Force kind of felt like the right thing to do, uh, which leads me to the third part of your question. What, what kept me in the Air Force? Similar to many of us, I think there's a reflection moment when you're at that yeah, I guess reenlistment crossroads where you're determining whether to stay or go. And and at my first reenlistment point, I I chose to leave the Air Force and or I've attempted to choose the, to leave the Air Force. That decision received some resistance from my squadron superintendent. His name was Chief Master Sergeant Don Paulson. And when he saw my, you know, my intention come across his desk that I was leaving, he just started pouring his passion into convincing me to reverse that decision. And it's, it's kind of an amazing story how this whole thing went down. Uh, our The squadron that I was in, the 964th Airborne Air Control Squadron at Tinker Air Force Base, was on tap to go to a maple flag exercise in Cold Lake, Canada. And at that time, I mean, I'm literally days from leaving the Air Force, starting terminal leave. My house is in boxes. And, and now I've got this chief that's like, hey, you, you need to stay in and, and I want you to come to Canada with me on this exercise. I was like, chief, there's no way, no way I could do this. And I mean, he was just relentless, relentlessly just almost begging me to go. And and finally, I, I was like, fine, chief, I'll go and ask my wife if, if it's OK for me to go on this on this trip. And he said, you don't have to ask your wife. He said, I already did. 
So uh, just to give you the level of passion he was pouring into keeping me in the Air Force. But uh, anyway, so we went on this we went on this TDY together. And I tell you, it was two weeks of some of the most intense mentorship I had received in my entire life. But even coming out of that experience, I, I still wasn't convinced. So he said, all right, last last ditch effort, you know, go back home to Nebraska for two weeks. And he just gave me a laundry list of items that I needed to evaluate when I got home. And uh, you, basically, what is life going to be like outside of the Air Force? And I'll, I'll tell you, I didn't make it through 10 days before I realized I was not uh, I was not where I needed to be. And now that challenge was getting back in, which if you remember the challenges our Air Force was going through in 2014 with the downsizing, you know, we were in a similar situation to that in 1997, where nobody was really interested in keeping a guy like me in our Air Force. Uh, but Chief Paulson and I, we paid a visit to our wing command chief. And I tell you, the planets just started to align for me. And, and I, I can't really attribute it to anything other than divine conspiracy. In a short couple of days, the 12th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force was going to be visiting Tinker Air Force Base. And he needed a driver. So they could have chosen any airman across the entire enterprise to be the driver for the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. And the Wing Command Chief selected me. And, uh, Took Chief Binkin, drove him around all day. Uh, we had a, a gentleman that was sitting in the back seat of the Suburban as we were driving him back to his lodging that night. And he started to tell Chief Binkin my story about kind of some, the laundry list of bad decisions that I had made throughout my career. And and uh, at the end of this story, he said, but the, the real reason that I tell you the story is because aside from all the dumb stuff that he did, like we'd really like to keep him in our Air Force. So Chief Binkin and I, we stepped out of the Suburban and uh, he asked me, do you want a career in the United States Air Force? And I assured him that I did. And as he handed me his coin, he said, all right, I'm going to do everything in my power to make this happen for you, but you've got to make me a promise right now uh, and that you are going to do the same thing for our airmen when you become a chief. And uh, I accepted his coin and, and uh, I told him I would do everything I could to fulfill that promise. And, and that's really uh, that promise I made back in 1997 as a senior airman to the 12th Chief Master Army of the Air Force and is what has kept me in, uh, in, in following this passion. Well, you certainly have made the best of your second chance, it seems. And you've been to three bases now as a command chief, that's right? Correct. So that was at Beal. That was it, Luke, and then now here at the Third Air Force. Yes, sir. Now, Chief, I know your your specialty is not firefighting or even anywhere close to civil engineering, but you know, in those roles as command chief, you've interacted with fire departments across the enterprise. For sure. What could you share from the command chief perspective that may be beneficial for our listeners to hear? Well, I tell you, recently, General Wood and I had an opportunity to visit our airmen at the 52nd fighter wing at Spangdalem, Germany. And if you're following, you know, they've, they've been through a lot over there the past several weeks. They had an F-16 crash. They had a vehicle accident that killed two airmen. Uh, and it was really important for us to get out there and just take a knee with the team, see how everyone was doing and to thank them for, for who they are and everything they do. And we got to meet with a great group of people who I, I consider the Airman Care Network. And these are our chaplains, the military family life consultants, counselors, the airmen and family readiness professionals, and of course, our first responders. And, and sharing time with these amazing people and hearing from each of their perspectives, how they navigated through these challenges, it really put into perspective how important this team is. Because across our society, there's there's people who run from or run away from events like these. And there's people who run head on into emergencies like these. And our firefighters and res first responders are at the tip of that spear and caring for our airmen and our families in amazing ways, just running straight into uh, some very um, intense environments. And, and that's what they're trained to do. And that's what they're passionate about doing. And and, and we walked away with a sincere appreciation how all of these diverse slices of our society just locked themselves in parallel. They worked seamlessly together to guide an, an entire community through through these extreme challenges. And we're grateful to have them on our team. The challenges never really stopped for us, it seems, in the emergency services career fields. 
you know, right now our fire and medical teams are out there on the front lines of this invisible battle. We're fighting against the coronavirus. Since we brought it up, you know, I just want to take a second to say from us here on the podcast to the responders out there, we hope you're staying safe, both in the station and on calls, that your departments and installations are taking steps to reduce unnecessary risk of contracting the virus and uh, that you're finding ways to keep a positive mental attitude during these crazy times. If you need to talk or share any stories or just have an experience that other firefighters need to hear, please uh, reach out to us. We're, we're here for you. So chief, before we talk about what you're currently doing, I'd like to go back to your previous job at the Air Force Strategic Integration Group. So the Air Force Strategic Integration Group was a pretty amazing experience. Um, I would say there's certain places on the planet farm kids from Nebraska shouldn't be. And Washington, D.C. is definitely one of those places. But I, I was blessed for the experience of joining the chief of staff of the Air Force's team to accelerate the implementation of his three key focus areas. So if you remember back in 2016 at the Air Force Association Convention at National Harbor in D.C., General Goldfein launched his vision to get after revitalizing squadrons, strengthening joint leaders and teams, and multi-domain command and control. And, and that has since evolved into joint all-domain command and control. So uh, General Saltzman invited me to come out and be on his team where we supported each of our focus area leads. And each of those teams were comprised of a colonel and a chief uh, for each of those focus areas. And they all had an entire support team of total force integration airmen, Department of Defense civilians, contractors. And, and our role really, the team role, was to implement very methodically the key tasks across the Air Force enterprise that supported the chief of staff of the Air Force's vision. Uh, not being an official program of record at the Pentagon, we could easily, uh, may, maybe not so easily, we could essentially navigate freely as we educated the Air Force and we drew talent from across our major commands and our functional communities who gave us the support we needed to start to implement these plans across the Air Force. You know, Chief, I've heard a lot about the AFSIG over the past year that we've worked together and some of the awesome things that your team did. What's something that you worked on there in the team that we could bring back to our fire community to share an improvement or an area that was, you know, significantly changed through your experience there? So I'm going to give you kind of a two phase response to that question. The first one is just understanding the why, like, why did we do all this work and why was this such a big deal? And the initial part of that answer to the why is, is really it's, it's driven by national defense strategy. So as we opened up cyber and space as war fighting domains, as we looked at really how far and how fast our peer-to-peer -peer adversaries are, are growing, uh, it really triggered some different ways of thinking across our Air Force. Like, how do we get after this? So if you could imagine putting a jigsaw puzzle together, you know, that you, you kind of tackle the easy things first. And, and I'm using this in relative just as an analogy, but you think the first thing you need to do is frame this up right. So you, you grab all the pieces that look like the frame and you put that together. And once you have that kind of boundary established, you could look at that as really kind of the efforts from the revitalizing squadrons role. It, it's just putting the frame around everything that we do as an enterprise. And then the next phase is, is really putting those like things together. Like you, you got all the different pieces of clouds and different pieces of trees and you put those together. And that's really kind of how we integrate and influence and lead in our joint communities. That's that part of the jigsaw puzzle. And then the remaining pieces are the really, really difficult ones. And those are the, the multi-domain or joint all-domain command and control pieces that are really, really difficult to put together because it's it's vague. It's something like we haven't seen before. And we're trying to build this kind of plane in flight, if you will. The why is if we do all of this right, if we put the frame together, we put all the joint pieces together, we put the joint all domain command and control pieces together, that, that picture that is represented at the end is really what 21st century deterrence looks like. And, and it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of people across the enterprise are making that happen. And the second 
piece of your question is, is, you know, what can we learn from that? And it's just a, regardless of your background, regardless of what you've been doing your entire career, like nothing is accomplished without a team mindset. And, and like I said earlier, we just, we pulled people from across the entire enterprise with diverse backgrounds. And there was one-on-one -on -one engagements that, you know, were up in the tens of thousands of airmen that were in these conversations to help shape uh, the future of of where our air force is going and every airman across the enterprise had a hand in that you mentioned the revitalizing the squadrons focus area which i believe a big part of that is actually looking at culture the fire service is rich in tradition and culture but you know there's always areas that we can work to improve on could you share your perspective specifically on culture absolutely um culture organizational culture, really, if I could describe it, it's, it's almost like wallpaper. You notice it when you walk into a room, you have a sense when organizational culture is good and you have a sense when it's bad and creating that right culture across our diverse wings. It's, is really a team effort and, and one that remains a, a key focus for general wood and I, in the short time that, that we've been together, we've traveled nearly 47,000 miles, you'd know more than anybody, just to spend time with airmen and getting their visceral feedback on on how we're doing. And there's there's just one discussion point that surfaces time and time again. And it, it really envelops, when you go out to establish and enhance a great culture, it begins with genuine leadership. And there's, a, there's leaders out there who have a check the box mentality, and there's leaders out there who have a fill the box mentality fueled by a passion to care for the person next to them. And, and now more than ever, we need leaders who are genuine. We need leaders who embrace who they are. Uh, and I mean, their strengths, their weaknesses, their quirkiness, uh, people see through leaders who are not genuine. And those types of leaders who are trying to be someone or something they're not, they just lose credibility. And, and really, it, it, it may circle back to my farm kid mentality. It, it comes down to the right leaders who aren't just expecting airmen to grow where they're planted. It's, air, it's leaders who are driven daily to enrich that ground that our airmen are planted in and giving them opportunities to grow. So after D.C., your next stop was here at the 3rd Air Force. Although I'm pretty familiar with what we do every day. Tell our listeners about what the mysterious numbered Air Force is and what your role in it is as the senior enlisted member. Well, my role as a senior enlisted member of 3rd Air Force really comes down to one thing, and that is just caring for airmen. Uh, the function of the 3rd Air Force is essentially to organize, train, and equip our airmen with the resources they need to do the mission that our nation is asking them to do. So it's really a supporting role. Like we, we lean in on this effort with our phenomenal command teams and, and leaders across United States Air Force in Europe and the United States Air Force is Africa, where our teams are just laser focused on caring for our airmen and our families and ensuring we remain lethal and ready to accomplish that mission that we've been asked to do. So essentially, we, we, we carry the water for our command teams. We want to do what we can to remove any obstacles that keep them from focusing on their mission. Uh, and that's a huge mission of caring for over 30,000 airmen across our area of responsibility. You mentioned taking care of airmen quite a bit in there. And I know intimately that that's kind of our bread and butter. So let's, let's break that open just a little bit through all of your jobs, your time with AFSIG and your time as a command chief, what key takeaways could you share with the listeners? I, I know we already hit on culture a little bit, but maybe some additional perspective you could offer in terms of caring for each other. Yeah. Again, Ben, it, it, I'm going to circle back to, to really what my passion is and, and, and my passion is, is the people. And, um, you know, I, I think of this, the kind of the shield mentality, a keeper of the shield. And I, I, I adopted this from, uh, a commander that I served with back at Luke and you know, you and I actually uh, helped create a, a, my coin that reflects this, but on the front of my coin is a shield and it's the, it's the same version of a shield that the Greek hoplites carried in the battle. And, and before they would step into combat, the mothers would tell their children and the elders would tell these young warriors, uh, come home with your shield or come home on it. And, and that was just 
you know, they could have said anything. They could have said, come home with your helmet. They could have said, come home with your, your, your spear, but they, they said, come home with your shield. And the reason why the focus was so much on that shield is because in combat, that is the warrior's only device that they had that cared to the person next to them. So that piece of equipment really was for the betterment of the entire organization. And when I say keepers of the shield, we all have that role and that responsibility to, to care for the person beside us. And if we walk into whatever challenge, whether that's COVID, whether that is an emergency response, if we walk into that with the care for the person next to you mentality, I, I think we win every single time. That's excellent advice, Chief. I remember when you first told me about the meaning behind the shield, it, it really spoke to me. Members of the military, first responders, medical professionals, few others out there really embody the team effort, service before self mentality. That's part of what drew me to this profession, you know, having a shared respect for service and sacrifice. It's not about you in the end. For sure. Chief, I know you and I have talked so much about reading and how it can really improve your capabilities as a leader, filling your toolbox with other people's experience and knowledge. I don't know that I've ever really asked you for which books are your favorite. What would you say the top three most influential books that you have read are that you would suggest to our listeners? I tell you word for word, Primal Leadership by Daniel Goleman. And there's a couple of other authors that wrote that with him. Uh, Word for word, that's probably one of the top most influential leadership books I've read. Uh, but there's other good ones out there. I mean, there's, gosh, we could probably talk for the next hour on amazing books that, that both you and I have read. Uh, the next one that really has resonated with me that I use a lot in, in conversation is Boundaries for Leaders by Dr. Henry Cloud. And that book teaches some, gives really two major tool sets to use. So uh, we talk about culture and we talk about growth and and really how that's created is on uh, between two different boundaries, the boundaries you create and the boundaries you tolerate. And inside of that is how teams will operate or how airmen will operate. And, and that's just, that has resonated with me for, for years since I've read that book. Uh, the last one, I, I tell you, I'll, I'll be transparent with you. I'm not all the way through it. Uh, you actually turned me on to this book. Uh, it's called the infinite game by Simon Sinek. And in just the short read that I've done up to this point, I, I'm probably a chapter or two into it. Uh, I've quoted that book more in the last two weeks uh, since I started reading it uh, than any other book recently. But that is an amazing, amazing book that I, I wished I would have had 20 years ago. Yeah, those are all excellent books. I, I haven't actually read the first one, so I will add that to my reading list. Good stuff. Well, Chief, I can't say it enough. Thanks so much for coming on the show and offering us some perspective. Is there anything you'd like to say to the listeners before we wrap this episode up? Well, Ben, again, thank you for the opportunity to to be part of this. And and I'll kind of end like I started. Uh, It's been great to to see uh, what you and your team have built here in in just a short amount of time. You've, You've reached uh, followership that's now in the three what three thousand viewers or three thousand folks that have have dialed into this uh, amazing platform that you've you've done and I'm I'm just proud of you uh, I, and it's an honor to work with you every single day and I, I your your passion is in, infectious it is inspiring and it, and it motivates me uh, to be better every day so thank you for this opportunity no chief it's my pleasure. That's all we have for you on this episode of the Fire Dog Podcast. You can find more content just like this regularly posted on our Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Fire Dog Podcast. That is facebook.com forward slash the Fire D A W G Podcast. Please like and subscribe and don't forget to rate this episode wherever you listen to your podcast. This has been Perry with our guest, Chief Kwiatkowski. Until next time, stay safe.